Well, good evening. I am delighted to see many of you here, and I should add that there are about twice, actually even more than that, or 50 or so who are online. So welcome those of you who are Zooming in uh, to this talk tonight. I should say that when we talked a few weeks ago about what the topic should be, this was of course before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we have lots of things that are happening very quickly and it's indeed a very dynamic time. I should say the aim of tonight's event is to talk through monetary policy topics and the special nature of the pandemic economic cycle. We will have a discussion of possible implications and an outlook for the European economy and specifically for inflation and monetary policy. Now, you may know that the ECB will assess the economic outlook at their March meeting. They will pay attention especially to inflation. Uh, some inflation numbers just came out. And of course, um, Philip Lane is coming to Germany to talk about inflation, a country that at least historically has worried a lot about inflation and has been a place that has wanted to see inflation numbers down. Um, I am delighted to have him here from the European Central Bank. I can't think of a better person to talk about the state of inflation in the European economy than Philip Lane. He is currently the chief economist of the European Central Bank. He has been a member of the executive board since 2019, and he is responsible for the Directorate General of Economics and the Directorate General of Monetary Policy. Before joining the ECB, he was governor of the Central Bank of Ireland. He's also chaired the Advisory Scientific Committee and Advisory Technical Committee of the European Systemic Risk Board. I know him best as a professor. Uh, he served as a professor for some time, uh, from 2012 to 2019. He was Waitley Professor of Political Economy at Trinity College Dublin. He also was a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research. He's a graduate of Trinity College Dublin, and he was awarded his PhD in economics from Harvard University in 1995. Uh, he started as an assistant professor of economics and international affairs at Columbia University at SIPA, which is indeed one of our dual degree partners. So, uh, although as we were just discussing, Hergy didn't exist back then, but at the same time, uh, it's great to have somebody with those Colombian roots here. In 2001, he was the inaugural recipient of the Benesser Prize for Outstanding Contributions to European Monetary Economics. So I hope I have impressed you with what his CV is, but I know you are going to be impressed with what he has to say. And I'm delighted, Philip, to, to see you here in person in Berlin. Uh, it's been too long since we've seen each other actually in person. And I'm delighted to see many of you come to one of the rare in-person events we've been able to hold. So Philip, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Welcome to the Heritage School. So uh, good afternoon. In fact, um, this is the first time I've spoken in front of an audience since I think uh, February 2020 before the pandemic. So actually, it, it feels a little bit odd to see actual people as opposed to just uh, figures on, on a Zoom screen. I'm especially pleased to speak here at the Hertie School, uh, which is really a strong record um, in, in European public policy research and, of course, in education including research on the EU area, the institutional ar architecture of the EU area. So it's always been very important to the ECB. And in that context, I also especially wish to acknowledge um, the contributions, the exceptional contributions of Professor Henrik Underline, who of course uh, uh, um, died so early, so, so uh, tragically, uh, who of course was uh, the former president and the, the founding, played a founding role in the development of the Jacques Delors Center. And uh, he was such a constructive critic of the ECB and more generally uh, played such a role in uh, thinking about the future of the Euro. Now, before turning to, to the topic of today's lecture or remarks, I should say, and uh, which is given in the title there, which is uh, what I want to do is connect the multi policy strategy of the ECB we, we spent a year and a half until summer 21 uh, working on this new strategy. And uh, what I want to explain is that wasn't just a kind of uh, exercise. It's, it's to me, it provides the playbook for monetary policy. So uh, when we think about different scenarios, all we have to do, honestly, is turn back to the strategy and say, well, the strategy, tell me what to do. And that's what we're going to do. But before uh, getting into that content, I do wish to comment on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. 
So last Friday, uh, President Lagarde put out a, a press release, a, a statement on the ECB website. Um, and uh, let me just remind you of the view of the ECB. So at this dark moment for Europe, the thoughts of the ECB's governing council are with the people of Ukraine. The ECB is closely monitoring the evolving situation. With regard to policy measures, the ECB will implement the sanctions decided by the European Union and the European governments. We will also ensure smooth liquidity conditions and the access of citizens to cash. And more generally, the ECB stands ready to take whatever action is needed to fulfill its responsibilities to ensure price stability and financial stability in the euro area. So uh, turning now to, to the topic, um, my, my goal is really to connect the current monetary policy debate uh, to, to the, our broader strategy. So today, I'm not going to overly dwell on the latest uh, data uh, reports or speculate on the evolution of the medium term outlook for the economy and inflation, because it's only one week away to our next monetary policy meeting. And that provides the best opportunity to provide a comprehensive assessment of economic and financial developments and their implications for inflation dynamics in the near term and the medium term. But let me maybe point out very importantly is the schedule for the March projections by the staff has been revised. There has been a change in the schedule in order to take account the implications of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And because of this revision in the schedule, today's Eurostat inflation release will be incorporated into projections that we will be examining in next week's meeting. So let me provide some empirical context uh, for, for the discussion. So what I show here is uh, since 2014, the evolution in blue of headline inflation and in orange of uh, core inflation. So what you can see from that graph is until very recently, and um, the, the narrative of, of the area for a long time has been, we have a low inflation problem. Uh, we have inflation typically uh, below 2%. And if you look at core inflation, incredibly stable around 1% before the pandemic. So in the context of our inflation target of two, having inflation for a long time being well below 2% uh, was a big uh, strategic challenge for us. Now you can also look at that graph and also you know, say, well, fine, that's history. What I'm more concerned about is what's happening in the last six months. So what we've seen is, is this very sar sharp uh, movement in inflation. So you can see for headline inflation, in the initial months of the pandemic, inflation plunged, in fact, from around 1% to below zero. There's such a big slump in the economy. And then you also had the policy measures, such as the temporary VAT cut here in Germany, pushing inflation and uh, negative. And what we've seen uh, since last autumn in the last six or seven months is this uh, basically very strong increase in inflation from a very low level. Uh, and today's number was 5.8%. What we've also seen is that uh, core inflation has also been moving up and is currently above 2%. So, so there's also a, a visible movement in, in core inflation. Now, when we think about that 5.8% uh, in, inflation number today, um, behind that number um, in terms of components, there was a 31.7% increase in energy inflation. So compared to a year ago, remember inflation is now compared to a year ago, basically uh, energy prices are 32% ahead of where, where they were a year ago. It's important to emphasize uh, that operates not just through the mechanical effect on, on the energy component of the, of the con consumption index, but it's also working indirectly. So that increase in core inflation you see there is also being driven, at least in, to some extent, or to a large extent, depending on, on how you think about it, with the fact that all sectors use energy as an input. Uh, the, the food industry uses energy, the services industry uses energy, the goods industry uses energy. 
So just on its own terms, uh, any sector where an important input rises in price by that amount is going to be put upward pressure on costs across the economy. Now, more generally, I've been emphasizing in some recent uh, contributions, uh, I had a blog post a few weeks ago and, and then uh, some remarks in, in mid-February, that essentially we can think of a, a lot of what's been happening uh, as two factors. One is the energy price uh, development, and then a, a set of pandemic-related factors, including supply bottlenecks. So, uh, you know, we, we've been uh, diagnosing that, that a lot of those issues uh, will not be a, a permanent source of inflation, but, but um, uh, are definitely uh, pushing inflation up today. And I suppose more generally, um, uh, it's essential for the central bank to ensure that uh, we fully take into account the implications of that graph, the implications of moving from a, a long period of inflation being very stable and well below the 2% target to a situation where, at the very least in the near term, uh, inflation has moved up. Okay, let me show you a second graph. So the second graph um, shows you uh, essentially a calculation of what is the equilibrium nominal, nominal interest rate. So this is really uh, two components. When you think about the interest rate um, in the economy, there's uh, two factors. One is compensation for inflation. And in equilibrium, uh, if we de deliver our 2% target, that will add two percentage points to the interest rate. And then you, the other contribution is the equilibrium uh, real interest rate. So, so that is the equilibrium real interest rate is the real interest rate, the inflation adjusted interest rate needed to make sure the economy is fully employed, full utilization of uh, uh, labor, full utilization of capital. So that's a kind of a well uh, defined concept in, in economics, but of course it's not directly observable. These are econometric estimates. And maybe the important point about the real interest rate is nothing says that has to be positive because essentially it's the intersection of uh, savings and investment. And if you have a lot of uh, desired savings in the world because of an aging population, a desire for safety and so on, and if investment is weak for all sorts of reasons, then the equilibrium real interest rate uh, can be negative. And essentially that's implicit in what we show here. So, so, so the shaded area shows you a range of estimates um, of this uh, equilibrium policy rate and remember these include an, a contribution of two percent from the inflation target and you see those estimates of the equilibrium nominal rate are somewhere between zero and two the blue line uh, is another way of calculating it which is just saying well what does the market think so the market if you you know uh, look at the uh, pricing of, of long-term interest rates the market thinks that the nominal interest rate nine years from now so that if you think about that being the long term uh, it is you know relatively low um you know so so that's telling you that the market thinks the real interest rate nine years from now is going to be negative and uh, essentially what this means is since uh, there's a limit to how much the nominal interest rate can go below zero right now our deposit rate is minus 0 0.5. So zero is not an absolute constraint, um, but there's a limit to how far below zero you can go. It does mean you face a situation which, if this is the equilibrium, what happens uh, when inflation is too low or when there's a recession and you want to push interest rates below the equilibrium value? And so this is the effective lower bound issue. And we, we, we spend a lot of time in, in the review thinking about the implications of the effective lower bound on interest rates. So um, in the end, uh, you know, the strategy review uh, uh, kept us busy. There's a, a lot of uh, work done. Uh, those of you looking to find topics for masters, dissertations and so on, uh, the, the hundreds of background papers written by staff in the EUR system uh, are consolidated into 18 occasional papers on the ECB website. So you can read the very, uh, and those are essentially 18 surveys. 
you know, surveying a lot of individual work. So we looked at a lot of different uh, topics in, in the review. But what I'm going to do is just focus maybe on some of the uh, big issues in relation to delivering the 2% target. So let me go back to my basic question here. Um, because you might argue, well, monetary policy, you can go every six weeks and make a decision every six weeks. Why do you need a strategy? And for me, uh, it serves two purposes, a strategy. One is you need a framework, a coherent framework that can tell you that um, if you see something developing in the economy, how that maps into a policy decision. So rather than start with a blank piece of paper every six weeks, have a framework, have a strategy to guide you. And second, it also allows everyone else to understand what we're doing. Because it, you can read our strategy, you can read the uh, background papers, and it helps markets, it helps uh, individuals to understand what the ECB is going to do. We like that because the more the ECB is predictable, the, the uh, easier uh, is the transmission of monetary policy. It's also important for accountability because uh, it's also because we have a public strategy. If you see us making a decision that is at variance with the strategy, it's reasonable to ask questions, you know, what are you up to? Are, are you delivering your, your strategy? And uh, maybe in today's context, it's very important to understand is if you have a robust strategy, it's especially helpful when there's maybe some, some change, some shift in the uh, underlying forces shaping inflation dynamics. Because it really, um, if you have to come off auto, autopilot and think about, is there something going on here? Uh, do we need to alter our policy orientation? Then having a strategy is helpful. So let me, uh, rather than, and again, you can find this speech on the EC website, and I, I give some uh, links to, to uh, other papers and a very longer academic paper coming out soon, which goes into strategy in more detail. But let me jump in uh, onto some core issues. So one of the conclusions of the strategy review is that we should take a, a symmetric perspective, that we should view um, our 2% target, which is also new, but you know, I think uh, not too surprising, uh, and essentially view uh, shortfalls of inflation from 2% as we had before the pandemic, and overshoots of inflation from 2% as equally undesirable. What does that mean? It means that, um, uh, that, that we, from a risk management point of view, when we think about monetary policy, we need to weigh up two risks. One is the risk of inflation being too low compared to 2%. The other is the risk of inflation being too high compared to 2%. And you know, we need to balance those opposing uh, risk factors in, in deciding policy. Now, very importantly, um, and a lot of the focus of the review was on this, the fact that we, we take a symmet symmetric perspective does not necessarily mean that the policy response should be symmetric. Because I, as I already indicated to you, and it's catching that picture, there is a lower bound to interest rates. Uh, we cannot uh, indefinitely, uh, without limit, cut interest rates. Whereas in, in the other direction, uh, there's no actual barrier to raising interest rates. Of course, you've taken into account the effect on the economy and so on, but there isn't the, the same uh, limit as there is on the lower bound. So then when we think about, okay, there is a lower bound issue, how do we think about that? So it's important to be clear um, that there's a clear hierarchy. So if we are away from the lower bound, and if the financial conditions are not stressed, so normal financial conditions, then the set of policy rates take primacy and should be sufficient to deliver the 2% target. So in other words, our strategic conclusion, which of course is not too surprising, is under normal conditions, monetary policy goes back to normal uh, policy instruments, which is moving interest rates around. Move them up, move them down. 
However, when the economy is close to the lower bound, either because, which happened in the uh, pre-pandemic period, the two uh, crises Europe suffered um, and some other factors, if you have a sequence of negative shocks pushing the inflation below the target, or as, uh, essentially if the economy is so subdued that the equilibrium real interest rate is very low, then you, it's not going to be enough. All the model simulations you're going to run, and we ran many model simulations in, in, in the strategy review, will tell you uh, that you're not going to deliver the 2% target unless you also use other policy tools. And uh, what are those policy tools? Uh, these include uh, quantitative easing, asset purchases. They could include uh, targeted lending programs, such as we have the, the Teltro program, and they can include forward guidance on uh, future policies. And uh, essentially, there was, again, the strategy was unanimously agreed that th these are all seen as important and uh, available policy tools if you have a low inflation problem, if inflation is, is stuck below 2%. Now, in relation to forward guidance, uh, the ECB currently has two types of forward guidance. One relates to quantitative easing, and in relation to net asset purchases under the asset purchase program, our forward guidance is that we will continue purchasing uh, as long as necessary to reinforce the accommodative impact of our policy rates. And that uh, this phase of uh, uh, purchasing is expected to end shortly before the key ECB interest rates are raised. So going back to our strategy, what does this tell you? It tells you that they have a, if you like, a subordinated role, uh, which is they are there to reinforce the policy rates. And if the inflation environment no longer requires reinforcement, then we will stop uh, quantitative easing. This also implies a clear sequencing that the, uh, we will stop qu uh, quantitative easing before we will uh, think about raising uh, the key policy rates. And this, this phrase about shortly before, we, we introduced this in September 2019, in order to prov provide a reassurance that net asset purchases would not be pre prematurely terminated, i.e. We're going to use them uh, until we're confident that, that uh, the policy rates can, can uh, take over on their own. Now, in relation to interest rates, the forward guidance is we are going to keep uh, interest rates at their current or lower level. And remember, they're at a, at a low level, the deposit rate is minus 0 0.5 uh, until three conditions are met. The first condition is, uh, is that until we see inflation reaching 2% well ahead of the end of our projection horizon. So right now we project inflation for this year, 22, for next year, 23, and the year after 24. Um, and essentially the goal here is, is to provide the reassurance that you know, if the forecast for the end of the horizon um, goes up, we're not going to immediately respond we need to be sure that inflation has built up enough momentum um, um, well ahead of the end of our horizon. So again, we're not going to prematurely um, raise interest rates. Um, and this is also in terms of a, a world of uncertainty important because we know under typical conditions, the inflation projections two years from now are quite uncertain. A lot can happen between now and two years from now. Now, uh, when we wrote the strategy last summer, that, that was essentially assuming the world would be in a typical situation, that the further away you are, the more uncertain is life. Uh, what's definitely true, uh, and I put a footnote in the paper, is basically right now we have inflation surprises by the near term. The energy situation, the pandemic situation, can be a situation where there's more uncertainty about this year than there could be about two years from now when some of these uh, temporary factors uh, fade away. OK, the second condition is not only do we need to see it well ahead of the projection, end of the projection horizon, but we expect it to last, that it's going to remain at 2% durably for the rest of the uh, projection horizon. 
And again, this very much uh, captures a part of what's going on now, which is inflation can go up for temporary reasons. And uh, it would be a mistake to, to raise interest rates if in fact the natural dynamic of inflation would be to fall below 2% um, um, over that horizon. And then the third condition says, not only do we look at the forecasts, we also need to be sure that progress on underlying inflation is sufficiently advanced to be consistent with inflation stabilizing at 2% over the medium term. So that condition uh, basically says we need to see what's going on right now, what's happening right now, not so much in terms of the overall inflation number, because there can be temporary factors, but can you uh, extract the underlying component, the component that's a guide to the next few years. And again, uh, this is especially helpful um, in relation to, to scenarios where there may be temporary factors that push up inflation today, but may not last. Now, it's very important to recognize that this concept of underlying inflation is, is a broad concept. And it refers to the persistent component of inflation that filters out short-lived movements in the inflation rate um, that are not expected to last. And of course, right now, as I indicated earlier on, there, there's two factors making it very difficult to uh, interpret the measures people look at for underlying inflation. One, as I already explained, the scale of the energy shock, 32% right now, means that producers of many goods and services, which are part of core inflation, uh, those prices are being raised uh, to just simply to respond to higher energy uh, costs. And this, so core inflation has an energy component, even though people like to separate those factors. The reason why that matters is to the extent the energy prices increases is a level effect. We're not going to see 32% increases every year for the next several years then the knock-on impact on core prices is also a level effect rather than necessarily representing a persistent source of inflation and then the second factor is the pandemic which means that there right now there are bottleneck factors there are sectoral mismatches in demand and supply which are not going to last and so uh, you know not just the ecb but many uh, other analysts also predict that core inflation has a temporary component which needs to be dealt with. So where does that leave policymakers? It's, uh, as I indicated earlier on, uh, you have to strike the balance. Um, so in one direction, um, uh, if we see a change in the forecast, um, it's, it's costly to wait too long. So if you have a situation where inflation, underlying inflation correctly measured it is maybe not yet moving, but the forecasts tell you that there's a good likelihood they will move in the next year or two. Waiting too long can be costly because you could get inflation expectations becoming the anchor to the upside. And if you wait too long, it runs the risk of having to do more later on, a sharper rise in interest rates later on, and a greater loss in output. So you might say, well, that's clear. However, uh, there's an, an opposite risk factor which is if inflation as it is now is above the target level, but that forecasts indicate inflation will fall of its own accord uh, over the projection horizon, tightening policy now in response to high inflation today would be counterproductive. Because under this situation, you could, you could uh, have a derailing of the convergence to the inflation target. Uh, you could send inflation back well below 2% and basically, uh, um, by tightening too quickly, derail normalization. So that's what we have. We have this high uncertainty. We have risk factors running in uh, competing and offsetting directions. Um, and so we, we have to take that into account in policymaking. Okay, so let me um, make a second point, um, which is uh, the strategy review also made it clear that when we think about price stability, we have to take a medium term perspective. Because uh, first of all, um, there are lags in the transmission monetary policy and there's uncertainty. 
So imagine if every month we moved monetary policy in re response to the latest inflation number. Uh, it would be totally uh, unclear how the economy would evolve because you're overreacting to every twist and turn in the inflation data. So the medium term scenario um, has always been at the ECB, going back to the founding of the ECB. And honestly, I think every central bank will have a medium term perspective. Now, a medium term scenario is especially relevant when you have an adverse supply shock, which is uh, what's hap happened uh, today with the, both the pandemic and the energy shocks. And it's, that essentially the conclusion here is, um, if the ECB tried to deliver 2% inflation this year in 2022, given these supply factors of pushing up inflation, the scale of the tightening we would need to do to deliver 2% inflation in the short run would really be something I think would not be uh, wise to do. So, so the, it is the case that sometimes you have to accept that inflation will deviate uh, from the inflation target. Now, again, there's, there's a but, there's always two hands, you know, every economist always has two hands, which is that principle is clear. On the other hand, if you have a supply shock, which means that inflation remains high for quite a while, it's still temporary, but it's hanging around for months and months, then there is a risk of changing uh, inflation expectations. Uh, there's a risk of the famous second round effects uh, and there's a risk of inflation not returning to the target. And so this is very important that we uh, monitor this risk factor, for example, by looking at indicators of inflation expectations. Now, it should be clear comparing now to the 1970s, because that's essentially what happened in the 1970s. There was an energy shock, but then it, it basically led to de-anchoring and an unstable inflation environment. Is It's so important that everyone understands the central bank is strategically committed uh, in a very uh, deep way to delivering 2% inflation. So if, if the, everyone understands we will take action, we will make sure that inflation returns to 2%, then it, it's hard for that de-anchoring uh, to take hold. Okay, maybe uh, very importantly, most of the time, uh, the most important element in making a monetary policy decision is, is to decide do we uh, understand what's going on? <laughs> you know, what is our prognosis? What is our analysis of the economy? So the strategy review spent a lot of time about saying, are we analyzing the economy correctly? And uh, th there is, a, again, a strategic commitment uh, that what we need to do is make an integrated assessment of all relevant factors. You might say that sounds obvious. But there, is a, there are competing series of inflation. Famously, the ECB had this twin pillar approach, which basically ran two models of inflation, one based on a monetary theory, one based on, if you like, on a macroeconomic view of inflation. And both have validity, but rather than treat these as separate series, uh, I think you know, it's important to integrate the assessment. And very importantly, and this is something we learned quite a bit from the global financial crisis and the European sovereign debt crisis, is it's very important to take into account macro financial linkages. Uh, the financial system and the real economy interact in all sorts of ways. It really matters for investment and consumption, for employment, uh, what's happening in terms of risk premia, stability of the financial system, availability of credit, and so on. Um, and a part of that uh, is also in terms of understanding how monetary policy works. So there's a famous phrase, the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. And it's very important to understand if we move our policy instruments, how that is it going to affect the real economy by affecting uh, financing conditions. So in the euro area, there's uh, one uh, strand of that, which is very important, which is in a monetary union, a multi-country monetary union, Self-fulfilling cross-border flight to safety episodes can impair the monetary policy transmission mechanism and threaten price stability. This is an inherent risk in a monetary union because geographical, so cross-border portfolio shifts are facilitated by the absence of currency risk. I can move uh, euro savings from one country to another without worrying about currency risk. 
if I was Japanese and tried to move money out of my home country, you also take on currency risk. And for many people, that's just a kind of a, a dead end. Of course, uh, that's reinforced by, by the fact that we don't have a, a complete architecture of the area in terms of banking union, fiscal union, capital markets union. So what does that mean for us? It means, although typically, and this is absolutely true, typically we can run monetary policy in a uniform way. Um, it's also the case that the ECB has repeatedly demonstrated its capacity to design flexible instruments in reaction to stressed conditions. So examples include the Securities Market Programme, the Outright Monetary Transactions Programme, program OMT, and most recently, the PEP, the Pandemic Emergency Purchase Programme. Now, in, in our December meeting, we announced we will be ending net purchases under the PEP this month at the end of March. Um, and I think that's a sign of the success of the programme. Um, but in recognition that, of course, um, uh, that, that that particular instrument in terms of net purchasing is coming to a close, it's important for us to also make clear our strategic uh, a commitment to, to flexibility. So in our December uh, monetary policy statement, we said uh, within our mandate, under stressed conditions, flexibility will remain an element of monetary policy whenever threats to monetary policy transmission jeopardize the attainment of price stability. So in addition to this general recognition of the value of flexibility under stressed conditions, uh, the statement also noted that even though the net purchases under the PEP are ending uh, this month, the accumulated PEP portfolio uh, can play a stabilizing role. So we said in particular, in the event of renewed market frag fragmentation related to the pandemic, PEP reinvestments can be adjusted flexibly across time, asset classes and jurisdictions at any time. Okay, so let, let me conclude by basically saying, uh, to me, uh, we put a lot of work into the strategy review, uh, the staff put a lot of work in, and it was basically designed to provide a playbook for all scenarios. And I would uh, very much encourage everyone, uh, if you haven't already, to study closely our strategy, because then once you study the strategy, you can basically tell what we're going to do. Now, there's always judgment involved, of course, but in terms of the underlying framework, uh, we've already told you what it is. Um, and maybe uh, I have a concluding section, but it's basically uh, summarizing what I just said. And I, I think uh, uh, I don't need to do that uh, to save some time here. So Mark, uh, maybe back to you. I have one initial question though, and I, I, I'm also cognizant of the time. I wanna allow lots of people the opportunity. Um, but when you, I, I was tempted to show it on my phone, but no one else will see it. You had this nice graph that showed kind of the, the decline in interest rates over time. Uh, and if I had the graph also, when I looked at unemployment in particular, and I look at labor markets, one of the arguments that we hear has to do with labor market tightness. There's something even in the FT today talking about France, UK, other sorts of places, how hard it is to find labor. Uh, we're a small university, but we even experience this in terms of trying to hire people to work at the Heritage School. And the question I would just ask is to what extent are some of these effects, perhaps on wages in particular, something that may not be temporary, but something that you need to factor into? And should we worry about what we talked about in the 70s, even these sort of wage price, it's probably too early to say, use that phrase, but these, as you look ahead, do you have concerns on the labor market as well? Let me, uh, let, let me slightly rephrase that. Do I have hopes for the labor market? So, so very importantly, in, in December, in our most recent projections, there was very interesting uh, kind of a development in, in the staff assessment, which is for the first time since the 1970s, the projection was that unemployment in the area would go below 7%. It would go to the mid sixes. Now, our kind of history of wage pressures in the area is essentially every labor market is nonlinear. If there's a lot of unemployment, uh, it's very hard to get a wage increase. But when the labor market heats up, then there's going to be more wage pressure. We'd already seen this. There was a decent uh, economic performance in 2017, 2018, and we had saw wages picking up then. And that's when wages went into the mid sevens. When we think uh, unemployment today is now, I think, 7-0, the most recent number around that. 
if we think uh, we are entering a new zone where unemployment is going to be below seven for the area aggregate, much lower here in Germany and some other countries, then to me that's a sign of hope that people will see improvements in their wages, which in turn will support the economy. Now, on top of that, then, you, then on top of that, there's an interaction effect, of course, second round effects. But to me, the, the bigger message is the foundation for sustainable inflation, this foundation for delivering the 2% target is we have a well operating labor market. I would say it does connect to the interest rate point to some extent that part of this is, is demographics. That there is essentially the aging of the European population. Right now, there's also a much smaller role for foreign workers than there was pre-pandemic. That's going to be one of the big post-pandemic questions. How much of the cross-border worker, how many cross-border workers, workers will return once the pandemic is over? Um, so what I would say is, um, but let me say that yes, there's more vacancies, the vacancy rate is going up, but let, let's keep this in perspective. Uh, there's a, a lot of people are still unemployed. A lot of people don't have the job they want. Um, and compared to the US economy, the vacancy situation is nowhere near in the same degree of kind of heat. Uh, so uh, very importantly, by the way, for, for the area, for the ECB, we have 19 member countries. Uh, it, it'd be mis it's a mistake to extrapolate from any one area. Because of course, Germany is a much stronger economy than some other economies. But then maybe on top of everything else is in a world of structural change, what we have is some skills are in scarce demand and you know, everyone has a chronic shortage of trying to find certain types of construction workers, data scientists. You know, we know the list of, of people which are in scarce supply, but there's a lot of uh, other areas where there's, where there's kind of excess supply of labor as well. Very good, thank you. I'm going to ask my first question online, but then afterwards I'm going to look around the room and see who would like to ask a question here. So do think about your questions and please do raise your hand. This question is from Paul H. What are your thoughts on the current euro weakness and does, and this is in quotes, do whatever it takes, in quote, mean more foreign exchange intervention or that there should be foreign exchange intervention by the ECB? Okay, so I'm aware there's been some uh, market commentary about the, the movements in the exchange rate in, in recent times. Let me emphasize um, that what we see is we saw in the first year of the pandemic, Euro appreciation. The Euro was going towards around 120. Now today it's 112, something like that today. To me, if you take a multi-year perspective, what we've seen is a reversal of the appreciation that happened in, in the first year of the pandemic. And then uh, when we think about what is the role of the exchange rate in the European economy, uh, there are all sorts of lags in the transmission of the exchange rate to the economy. So uh, in the data, I think there's gonna be some residual effects of the appreciation in 2020, and then there's gonna be some more immediate effects of the recent uh, reversal of that appreciation. But by and large, if you say, okay, come, a lot of the time it's useful in a pandemic to say, okay, compare the value of any economic indicator to the pre-pandemic value, and the exchange rate is not too far away from the pre-pandemic value. Uh, to the extent it's, we always look at it, we always track it, um, but right now in terms of uh, the narrative for the exchange rate, um, it's maybe a, a simple way to think about it, is it's, there's been a reversal of the appreciation we saw in the first year of the pandemic. Okay. Very good, thank you. Um, Klaus Deutsch, would you like to ask a question? Yes, uh, Klaus Deutsch from the Federation of German Industries. Mm -hmm. Two quick questions. One is, what is your judgment on the uh, factor that supply side disturbances in particular from logistics, transportation and you know shortages outside of the energy sector might still play a role in the month ahead uh, for um, you know price developments in the euro area and the second one is a bit more complicated which is on the interaction between monetary policy and um, essentially uh, macroprudential uh, policies now we have seen a number of countries that had pretty strong developments in housing markets for which there are a number of uh, macroprudential policies in place now 
Um, but again, you have uh, in many of those countries also very strong public policy supporting the building of new houses. So there's obviously a, uh, an unresolved conflict of instruments there. Um, and in relation to that, um, if you look at the EU policies at the trend transition that are supposed to uh, lead to a permanent higher level of fixed asset investment into the green transition that would go along with a um, delinking of the traditional ratio of uh, credit to GDP, because it, it would go along with more lending and more borrowing. And how would you respond to that in the macroprudential tool set? If you apply it mechanistically, you would have to rein in uh, to green lending. Uh, if you, um, you know, adjust uh, the target, you have to communicate it. And I, I don't see a discussion on that yet. Thank you. Okay, you, you packed a lot in, in, into, into those uh, questions. So, so on the first um, question, which is about other types of supply shocks, the non-energy supply shocks, which, you know, I, I think uh, we've seen a lot of bottlenecks in, in uh, basically in manufactured goods. So, um, and there's really two driving forces behind that. One is there are some pure supply issues. Uh, the, the, uh, in, again, the first of the pandemic, many uh, logistic firms, many manufacturers assumed that the pandemic would be worse than it turned out to be. So they cancelled investment, they under-planned uh, inventories, and there, there was an initial supply shortage. And then when you on top of that, in, this, it, it with COVID, various factories shut down for uh, spells. And by the way, going to, to the transition, uh, since my time at ECB in 2019, the amount of times when the explanation for a supply shock has been weather. So there's been fires, there's been floods, uh, there have been reasons connect to climate events, which again led to interruption of supply around the world. So we had that, and then on top of that, uh, we had a very strong recovering demand, especially in the US. Uh, you know, the in Europe consumption is not quite back at pre-pandemic levels. In the US, with the amount of fiscal support, a uh, consumption of goods went to 30% above the pre-pandemic level pretty quickly. So you, you had this mismatch. Now we have a tracker, and in a recent uh, blog post on, on bottlenecks, I explained the tracker at the ECB. And what that basically showed, yes, throughout last year, uh, this tracker did say more and more uh, supply bottlenecks. Uh, but by the end of the year, it was basically leveling off. Uh, I think some of the recent data, the car industry here is producing a lot more. So th there are signs that some of these bottlenecks are, are kind of being resolved. But I would share the view that it's, you know, depending on the industry, it's going to be with something with us all year long but maybe depending on the industry, getting less important month by month. So the fact they remain, for the inflation dynamic, it's not whether there's a bottleneck or not, it's is the bottleneck getting worse or, or getting easier. So my sense is uh, it's something we have to account for, but honestly, I'd be confident that this bottleneck factor will ease over the course of the year. The transition um, uh, it has all sorts of uh, angles to it, um, let me um, emphasize with the transition is, my view is it's a mistake to get caught up in any one narrative because there's so many different ways the narrative can play, the transition can play out. Um, there is a kind of a boost to the investment sector of the economy from uh, the fact that corporates, governments, households have to do more investment. One of the big unknowns is whether that increase in investment has to be uh, mean that consumption has to fall. Because if you have a fully employed economy to have more investment, you're going to need less consumption. So you might have a scenario where the inflation price deflator goes up, but the consumption deflator goes down. So, so it's not obvious to me on net what the overall inflation dynamic from the green transition will be. It very much depends on the exact detail. Then uh, you then interactive uh, transition with macroprudential. This is a, a very important uh, topic. And again, uh, 
um, the lesson from the global financial crisis and the property boom bust cycles we had here in Europe is you definitely need macroprudential policy. And one of the issues for the last decade is countries, some earlier than others, have been rolling out all sorts of measures and is now the rollout of more measures right now. This is something that um, has two forces. One is if there were a crisis in the future, the pain of that crisis should be less if banks are better capitalized. So the dynamic of it, so, so that's for sure. The other element is maybe some of these measures slows down uh, any kind of speculation right now. So if you have a, what are called borrower based measures, so you limit the amount of debt an individual can take on, or you can limit the amount of debt a corporation takes on, maybe the bubble doesn't get so severe in the first place. Uh, depending on the exact tools you have in place, whether that second mechanism is at play or not depends. It definitely is working in some places for sure. Um, so, so those two forces, we as the ECB in the strategy review, we spend a lot of time saying, look, we have to take account of that interaction effect. Absolutely. And that's honestly, uh, every day in my email, there's some new measure somewhere being debated. So, so it is very much a, a very live issue. Then when you go to the issue, well, you know, if we have a, and it pervades everything in terms of financial system, so the taxonomy for, for green finance, the need for many people to take on debt to finance a retrofit of their home, uh, corporates who need to, so it's a huge issue. Um, I, I'm gonna be an optimist and say, I'm sure the world of uh, policymakers can handle this because it's still, it's not the case that you can say, well, because it's green, it's zero risk. Uh, you know, no matter what, what your motivation for, you still have to think about uh, overall credit dynamics, um, of course, in many cases, there's a fiscal dimension to it, uh, but absolutely uh, the transition also raises questions for how exactly to design macroprudential policy. But um, we, it, they're both important uh, objectives, have financial stability and have a good transition. Very good. I have two questions online, that both have to do with Ukraine. So I'm going to ask two consecutively. Uh, one's longer than the other. One is from uh, Jao Faria. You mentioned during a speech on February 17th that inflation to the euro area is now, quote, expected to settle around 2%, end quote, which implied a different path for the ECB's net asset purchases. I understand that an, ass that an assessment by the Governing Council will be made only next week, but in your personal view, do recent conflicts in Ukraine make it more likely that we go back to a scenario of inflation settling below 2%? The second is by Marie Staub. How do you guess the geopolitical tensions uh, regarding the invasion of, of Ukraine will affect the normalization of monetary policy? So both involve Ukraine. I, re I would have just emphasize, I know what you're going to say about personal views, that's not the point. But in terms of the discussion here, if we could have it open the box, I guess at least, of potential implications of Ukraine. Okay, I'm gonna give fairly clear and emphatic answers here. Uh, so first of all, the question was uh, not really correctly posed, by the way, the first question, because uh, I mean, I did give the speech, but I was very careful not to convey any personal opinion whatsoever. What I did say is surveys indicate that many uh, market participants, many professional forecasters are increasingly of the view we will deliver the 2% target. Uh, I did not convey any personal view. Second, on Ukraine, um, we, we are one week away from our monetary policy meeting. I can tell you back in, in uh, Frankfurt right now, a lot of people are assessing all sorts of uh, dimensions of the implications of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I'm afraid I think I can, uh, people who are curious about the, you know, our view uh, can, uh, can wait till next week. Uh, and I'm not going to preview that. But I should also importantly emphasize, of course, there's a world of uncertainty. Whatever we say next week is basically our kind of best effort guess on the basis of what we know now. This is not going to be a kind of a final answer. It's going to unfold uh, in the coming weeks and maybe longer, the full implication. But it's very incompetent upon us. And I indicated in the, in the remarks, we delayed or rescheduled our normal way of doing projections in order to create as much time as possible 
to have that fir first cut of our of our understanding. Um, but again, uh, it's a week away. I'm afraid it, that time is better spent doing the analysis than than uh, giving previews. Very good. I, I think I kind of guessed you were going to answer the way you did, but uh, it makes a lot of sense. I have a five, we only have two or three minutes, so I'm going to just give you a final question from Andrea Schneider from Commerzbank, who is also from online. We learned that Mr. Powell might be going to increase interest rates uh, in April. As an outlook, to what extent is the situation in the European Union different than the inflation outlook in the US? And this is something you alluded to, in fact, in responding to me, sure. and I think it's a chance for you to build on that. So again, I, I took this on in a recent uh, 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 contribution, where if you look side by side, what's going on in the EU area and what's going on in the US, there are common elements. There is a global component to inflation. The bottlenecks have a global component. Energy is a global component. What is different is where we are in terms of the domestic business cycle. I've indicated to you, and remember, only now, we, we still have lots of restrictions on economic activity in Europe. Uh, the, the recent months, there, there has been a, a pretty quiet period for the services industry because of that. Now, we are confident there's going to be a good recovery this year. You know, we are confident that you know, a lot of the pandemic, in terms of its economic impact, is going to fade. Uh, but the, the amount of uh, domestic demand we see in Europe, the heat in the labour market, uh, all of those, the level of consumption, uh, these, these are just in a different place in the business cycle here compared to, compared to the US. Uh, and that's also evident in the inflation data. Inflation is high everywhere, but the scale of the inflation uh, pressure in the US is far different to here in Europe. Very good. I should say I was in California two weeks ago, and I think that the only word I heard was inflation when it had something to do with the economy. So it's an interesting to hear you make that comparison. We are out of time. I want to thank you very much, Philip, for coming. Uh, it was very good to hear also much more about the strategy and to, to think through about some of the implications of the strategy of the ECB. And I, all I can say is uh, it has been too long, and I hope you have a chance to come back again. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you.